What's up, everybody? Lucky Lefty Podcast, Anora Boys, definitely in the building. Brought to you by Anora Whiskey, AnoraWhiskey.com. It is a premium American whiskey, AnoraWhiskey.com. And if you drink, by all means, make sure you do so. Responsibly. Got to do it responsibly. CFB Nation, Apple Podcast, Spotify, audio edibles each and every day. YouTube, make sure you go smash that thumbs up for us. Subscribe. Share, let everybody know, Lucky Lefty Podcast. Hit the notification bell so every time we go live, you'll know. Home of the misguided passion, forever committed to making sure that we continue to do what? Spin it. Different. Different. Yeah, yeah. Love how you feeling, boy. Another day in paradise. Hey, I know that's right, boy. I'm, you know. I'm sitting up there struggling. Uh, man, I got <laughs> birthday coming up. You know, hey, it's the um, big, it's the big birthday, man. It's supposed to be the best month of the year, man, bro. I can't get outside to play no to play golf, bro. This weather sucks. You're out there in golf heaven. You know what I'm saying? Just hit a back nine the other day. See what I'm saying? I'm just gonna <laughs> stick the knife on my back and just turn. It, huh? Just go ahead and turn. It. That's, I'm that's ready for you to snowbird your way over here. Ladies I'm waiting for that, ladies and gentlemen. That's that's brotherhood for you right there. You know what I'm saying? When you're weak, your brother's supposed to make you strong, and this dude is just sticking the knife deep. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, just, I'm just waiting for you to hit your escape route. You know what I'm you saying? Know, everybody got the escape route. I know you got the map ready to go. You just waiting for you to hit the road, man. And it was the way he said it, ladies and gentlemen. You have to pick up the way people say things, right? He said it like, oh, you know, I just randomly was like, ah, let's go play nine. Let's go play nine right quick. That's how right. he said it. Like he right. has that right where he is. <laughs> just be on the couch watching Law and Order and just say, you know what? Hey, fellas, y'all want to go get nine in right quick? Just right quick. Yeah, just right, right quick. Because the way because the way the light is shining through, yeah. I can't even get it's a glare on the TV. It's telling us yeah. to go outside. Yeah. We gotta go hit something. Because about what? He can be done in about what hour and a half. Be back sure. home to dinner. We might yeah. we might just get back and just hit a couple balls after, just because the weather just gonna last so long. You know, we try to take up sunlight. Man, so excited, man. Practice yesterday, totally busy, man. I had practice, family, ministry stuff all going at the same time. So yesterday, Riley Leonard shows up to practice in a walking boot, bro. I don't want to say walking boot. It is like a walking brace. More so, still with the limp, but he was throwing the ball. Didn't participate in live action, anything of that nature. Just keeping his arm in shape. And you know what I'm calling him? You know what I'm calling Riley Leonard from now on? He is Optimus Prime. <laughs> now, Optimus Prime in every Transformer movie is nowhere to be found. The whole movie. Because he's always destroyed from the previous movies, lost in space trapped in some dungeon, unavailable. But then down the line, down the line, at the climax of the season, here he comes to save the day. That's the perception. He's going to save the day, coming in at the right moment, the right time. So he's Optimus Prime. He's not reliable the whole hour and a half in the movie. He's on low management. You know, he's in outer space, the Decepticons done got him. <laughs> and disassembled him somewhere and about two and a half hours in the movie 30 minutes left here he comes to save the day lead the charge so he is optimus prime of the season that's crazy i never thought about that you know i stopped after the second transformers by the way left i didn't see any other transformer movie after that by the way, happy 10th anniversary to uh, Winter Soldier, which is a top five MCU movie. That's right. Not, not even up for debate. That's right. right. Go, go talk to your mama. It's not even up for debate. <laughs> not even go talk to your mom. Not even up for debate. Winter Soldier, Captain America, Winter Soldier, top five MCU movie. Period. No well, discussion needed. No discussion needed. So, Left, go ahead, flip a coin. 
see which coach we talk about. And oh, Mike Mickens. Okay, Mike Mickens. Mike Mickens talked to the media left. We'll get to the practice record report second half of the show. Really dive into some of the things that happened. You know, I'm so happy to actually get a full practice access next week left. Oh my god. Driving an hour to get 45 minutes. It's like it's real tough. It's like man schedule unnecessary meetings just to fill up some more time. Man. Try to grab a coffee or something. <laughs> Because you're losing. You're losing on the trip. People keep telling me to go hit at this spot called Ragamuffin. Oh, what a muffin? Ragamuffin. It's a oh. new spot in South Bend. Yo, you got to try to have fabulous muffins. So I'm coming from, you know, practice, headed back to Chicago. And I usually want to grab some hot chocolate and a, a nice blueberry muffin or an apple muffin if they have something along those lines. And lo and behold, man, it's one of those spots that's like open 10 to 3 or 10 to 2, but it's only like Tuesday, no, Thursday through Saturday or something like It's something crazy. Man, like super crazy hours. They're not even open like Sunday through Wednesday or something. It's crazy. Oh, so they, they, they are ragged. <laughs> they are ragged. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm used, hey, Chicago. That's I'm used to Chicago. I'm used to Chicago with Catholic open six, seven days a week, bro. See, here's one thing I know is about you Chicagoans with this whole food prestige. Y'all walk around with this food privilege out here acting as if y'all the standard of all food, and then y'all judge it off of that. I feel like that's that's a misnomer. You guys why are you mad missing. though. Why are you mad? <laughs> I'm trying to figure it's out not why about being mad. mad. It's just it's just something I'll be noticing lately. You sound a little perturbed. LL Nation left sounds a little perturbed by that, right? Why are you mad? I, I was just throwing I'm not, I'm not perturbed. I'm not perturbed <laughs> that you get to play a back nine out in the AZ. I'm not perturbed by that. But you mad because our city is lit when it comes to cuisine? You're mad about that? It's like y'all got there. a bunch of you chef out there, the out there or something. You're out there in the wilderness when you get to cuisine? <laughs> You have nothing to look forward to in AZ, but you're mad about us. <laughs> Come on, bro. It's just something I've noticed. I'm just like, man, you guys sure do hold this this certain food privilege when you go around judging other cities. <laughs> Who have we judged? I haven't judged anybody. Man, I, I've, never judged, I've never judged LA. I constantly tell you I got spots in LA. I have spots in New York. I always talk of New York. I love the <laughs> South. I love Atlanta. Tell you, I, the only cuisine I talk about is Detroit and that pizza. I tell you, <laughs> hey, your pizza's trash, bro. That's the only Not thing the I say. Trash. <laughs> Super trash. Big time trash. Big time trash. Yo, Mike Mickens on the transition from just being a defensive cornerbacks coach to now being a defensive back coach and coaching the safeties. How has that been for you, coach? Good. It's been good. Um, you know, all of it is is relationships even going even tighter and tighter together uh, with the guys in the room and then uh, me and in there now hearing one voice with it as well. Uh, with it, you know, as before it's been separate a little bit. So they always had been a tight relationship, but now it's just everybody knows everybody and what they're doing in there and things of that nature. So everybody's in the same room getting the same teaching. Uh, we're going to talk about how Don Schuler has definitely been in the film room with Coach Mickens. And it might be why he's showing up big time in the spring, especially in the one-on-ones and in the live action, playing very well next to Xavier Watts at that safety position, the red shirt freshman. And we'll talk about some of the comments he had about the red shirt freshman that he had back there, Michael Bell, Ben Minnick. Hearing good things about those young men, but let's just talk about the challenge of coaching an entire defensive backfield. Is it challenging, or do you feel better that Mike Mickens has his hands on everybody now? I like that Mike Mickens has a stage of progression. It's like the pyramids. The pyramids just didn't start in Egypt. Mm. You, know, you got to travel north, and you see how there's ways that it was built. There was a, a red pyramid that was just slightly off. There was a step pyramid before the red pyramid, before they smoothed it out. So you see a progression. And this is a Mike Mickens that went from an assistant, has nurtured and groomed and trained some guys that end up going all the way, not just from a freshman, but from freshman to rookie of the year. 
in the NFL. So he's had all the proper steps. And I think this is just another step in his cap or, or a feather in his cap because he's going to go from the entire secondary to hopefully a D.C. somewhere at a nice school. So this is just a nice prepping stage where he gets one voice. You know, it's like, yeah, I may not call the plays, but the one voice is going to travel to the whole secondary. That's a great responsibility. And he's earned it. I think he's earned it through recruiting. He's earned it through his development, but also been able to, you know, prove and have proof of concept. Turn the guy from a receiver to a defensive player of the year, in a sense, just being able to work with the a first round receiver, a DB that popped on the scene. So you're talking about a guy that's, as if anybody could do it, Mike Makers could do it. Breaking news, love. You want to hear this one? You want to laugh? LSU's Haley Van Leaf has entered the transfer portal. <laughs> yeah. So where? You go where? The way you got exposed this season? Where are you going? Back to Louisville? Where are you going? Because it's been shown you can't play on the big stage. Can't shoot anymore. Can't defend. <laughs> yeah, she's out of there. Hey, John Masty, you're right on point. We're going to get back to Mike Mickens in a second, Left. This is you, Left. You, you go to the same chain restaurants no matter where you go. No, I'll, I'll go to ones that <laughs> no, I'm just the show. You definitely hit you hit Chipotle wherever you go. Doesn't matter. Chipotle is just a standard. That's like, you know, it's like different popcorn in different arenas. You know, you got to test out the popcorn because they all different. So every Chipotle is different. That's why if you ain't got a good Chipotle, I can't try your other stuff. How you mess up Chipotle? Left. <laughs> Who has the best popcorn in the country, Left? Target. Target popcorn. Lucky, lucky little dog in there. We're about to go to yes. Mike Mickens right now. We're about I'm to go to Mike Mickens right now. This dude said Target popcorn. Go I to the Target Marketplace. Uh, We'll get I, have, you I have theaters in Chicago that have better popcorn than Target. I don't believe it. I don't, okay. I, I, it's yet to be proven wrong. Okay. John Massey's telling you the truth. Chicago, is it not even close? Here we go with these Chicago. Chicago. Fire. These, these Chef Ramsey's all in Chicago. Don't do it. You sound <laughs> really. Wait a minute. Did you watch a documentary or something last night? Like, you really offended by the Chicago cuisine today. What is uh, <laughs> Lucky Lefty podcast, man. He, man. Mike Nick is talking about a Don Shula. Last week, uh, Coach Biagi mentioned that Don had been in your room quite a bit this spring. I guess, what do you get out of those meetings with him? And I guess, what do you, those conversations kind of like? Yeah, uh, no, he's uh, growing and he's, uh, he just wants the, the knowledge and he wants to keep coming in. He just wants to get better. He wants to find a way to get better every day, you know, with the uh, challenge everything part of it. So uh, that's what he's doing. Um, you can see he's hungry. You can see that he's being very intentional on the field. Um, he's working hard you know, on and off the field. So uh, been a, it's been a pleasure. Now, Mike Mickens is directly still working mainly in practice with the cornerbacks, Marty Biagi, other coaches. You see them specifically in drills, working with the safeties. Marcus Freeman will come over and spend the time with the linebackers, pays a lot of attention. Marcus Freeman has actually worn the pads for the safeties in uh, pursuit drills and tackling drills as well. So there is intention put on the safety position and make sure the transition for whoever starts next to Xavier Watts is ready to go. But Mike Mickens looks very comfortable being able to have his hand on everybody. And the fact that Don Shuler has been in the film room with him, it goes back to what you said. The steps that have already been established in development with Mike Mickens, you feel good about what a Don Shuler could become this year for the fight night. Absolutely. And this is just a, a, by, a bicosm or a byproduct of when you have a first round guy in the room. You got a defensive player in the room. You got a lot of talent that came in and out of that room in very recent years. This is what we want to see the receiver room blossom into because Adon is just watching everybody else in the same room as him doing things that are on the top scale of the country, being a first-round pick, being a, a, a defensive player of the year, being a high draft pick, high reps at a young age. So this is like you better get in before while it's hot. You got to raise your level of competition because the belief factor 
is in that room. And not only are you seeing it in the guys in that room, but the coaching staff and the responsibilities that Mike Mickens has been able to put uh, on that room with the lead by examples that you love to have as a coach. It's just a matter of uh, something that's that's building that's pretty special. Marcus Freeman is almost, you know, being able to ride this bike without his hands. So it's going to be a, a good opportunity. I'm sorry about that left. I almost chased the UPS man down the street. No, ring the doorbell and then bang on the door like he's the popo, bro. That's right. That's right. And then I'm thinking it's a big package and it's like a little letter pack. No, he's serious pack. about the letter package. Yeah. Taking his job a little bit too seriously. Lucky enough, podcast. But I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree with the things you were talking about. Mike Mickens makes me feel really comfortable when it comes to development and the safety position. And let me tell you something, Chris O'Leary, man, he did without having the same amount of talent that Notre Dame has recruited, has in the room now. And I think the safety class from 23 was at a certain level. I think the 24 class is at an even greater level. And then the 25 class could be the greatest safety hall. I mean, they have still, they still have Dallas Golden. He's probably going to end up playing cornerback. They still have Jagon Blair. They get him along with Ethan Long and, and the other guy in the safety room. You're talking about definitely the biggest haul and the best haul we've seen in Notre Dame at the safety position. And Mike Nickens being part of that development along with Marty Biaggi, I can see some great things and some future first rounders besides Xavier Watts coming through that safety room at Notre Dame. Yeah, I mean, the tone is set and the stage is made for guys to come in and be attracted to it, not only in recruiting, but also they see in the development from year one to year three or four. So it's awesome to see these guys uh, see Notre Dame as that, that bat signal. They, they mm. respond to it. They run into the signal. Now they say, oh, that's that's the hot spot for safeties, and it's going to be for safety. So as long as Mike Mickens and the, and the crew, Marty Biaggi and, and, and Al Golden are, are doing that trifecta thing going on, you're seeing the products of first round and potential uh, top award winning safeties and corners. Lucky Lucky Podcast. Our boy LeBron Whitaker just tweeted out he thinks he's going to end up in Kentucky or either South Carolina. Man, I, the man. I, I, if she goes to South Carolina, me and Don got props. I'm going to have to place a call. I'm just letting you know. I'm just letting you know. Another young man with a bunch of promise. Or two young men with a bunch of promise. One playing the boundary. We'll get to that coming up in the practice report. And the other, yeah, he could be a dude. Jay Mickey, Christian Gray, Mike Mickens talking about that team. Just the next step, right? Just the next step. He's very talented. He's very competitive. Uh, so just to see him growing and understanding the game is going to slow down and now just continue to go out there and be a playmaker as he is. Coach, I guess how have you seen uh, Jaden evolve this spring, mm-hmm. especially going into the junior season? Yeah, he, uh, he's a leader. He, he talks. He's vocal. Uh, he's a guy that, a guy that uh, challenges everybody. Works hard every day. Comes in with an intentional mindset. Uh, he just wants to get better. So you can tell, you know, he's been around the block a lot. So he's ready to go. The character of Jay Mickey is undeniable, ladies and gentlemen. If you know what this young man has been through and has continued to persevere and shown the resilience, an exemplary student, great young man. And gets better on the football field, you know what you have there. And then you just throw in the first round talent that is Christian Gray. <laughs> this cat, Mike Mickens, and his evaluation along with his development makes you feel like, hey, the cornerbacks are going to be first round. They're starting with Ben Morris, and we can start the dominoes falling with these cornerbacks at Notre Dame as well. Uh, and those yeah, two can be right to, behind them. Well, it's, it's great to see us address the issue of something that we speculated for so long when Brian Kelly was here about the secondary mm-hmm. and to be able to see a total three, six, 180 and in, in, in the opportunities that have presented themselves through guys that we've recruited that are first round talent. You know, Jaden Mickey came in making noise. Christian Gray is coming in physically looking like he could be something. Ben Morrison has popped on the scene and stayed on the scene. And even a guy like Cam Hart who came back and got better. 
How often does that happen? A fifth year come back and get better coming off an of injury, prepared for the league. So Mike Mickens has his hand in all of that, and he's proven it before he's gotten there, and he's continued that success almost on a, a he stand type of level. I can see in terms of producing corners at a rate in which he's doing. I'm interested in asking LL Nation as an LL question today. You just brought up Cam Hart. There are a lot of people in the Notre Dame fan base that felt like Cam Hart was possibly blocking opportunity for guys like Jay Mickey and Christian Gray and wondering whether or not he should have come back or going to the NFL next year. A lot of people felt like, well, he's a third, fourth round guy. You talked about his improvement. My question to Notre Dame fans, was it worth it for Cam Hart to come back? Did he change your mind about him? Did Cam Hart change your mind about him? There are a lot of people who said, well, he's real handsy. He drafts a lot. He does this. He struggled, he struggled in coverage, even though we tried to tell people this man has played through the amount of injuries that you wouldn't believe just to be a leader because there was no one else back there. There was no depth there. Has he changed your mindset from what it was before last season? And the question of the day, did he change your mindset about him left? Well, I know this is the incubator. You know, mm. you got something good cultivating it's a place. You want to stay around it for as long as you can because you're going to get better from it. And, you know, Cam Hart nursing an injury, but also having more experience in a, in a system that's progressing you, not just you in a place that you can take more reps. So because he got better technique in his season coming back, it just proves that, you know, at that position in that unit, that this is something that guys want to come back to. I mean, he sees the importance of why he needed to come back because he felt like this is a place where he could get better, just like Ben Morrison is continuing to get better year to year. And that's something that is a great standard to have because you get guys like a Don Schuler, you get guys like Ben Manage, you get like guys that uh, want to come in and make an impact day one. You see that be more of a, a retention factor that you want to have in a program like this. We see some comments. We're going to get to the comments about Cam Hart in a second. But left, look, man, going back to all Mike Elko, Clark Lee, we've had some really good defense. Bob Diaco, you've had some really good defensive coordinators over the last 12 to 15 years here at Notre Dame. Is there, is there a defensive system, right? We've put a lot of great defensive players in the NFL during that time left. But have you seen a more pro-ready, pro-style development system for big-time draft prospects other than Al Golden's system in Notre Dame on defense? Like, do you compare Al Golden and how his defense sets you up for the NFL, the current NFL? Compare that to the other great defensive coordinators that have been in Notre Dame. Is this the best one that you think that fits the improved talent that Marcus Freeman has brought here? Well, I think anytime you get a coach that has a scheme he's committed to and knows how to plug players in, it's going to be like honey and bees attract to it. And I think when you have the time to develop that over three years, he came in at the right time when these players were young enough to catch on and have enough time to grow before they graduated or went to the league or whatever. Now you've got to see a, a roadmap. And I think when – you're in year three, you're seeing the strengths and weaknesses of a Jaden Mickey after a year and a half, two years. Now you know exactly how to get the best out of him, as well as playing off of guys like Xavier Watts and uh, um, and Ben Morrison. You can plug a guy like Michael Bell in there to be able to play in a position where he's comfortable and can play to his strengths because he knows he's got backup all around the field. So once you get a system in place with a guy like Al Golden, who has had that experience at the next level and had success, and he was hot at the time, carried it over, and Marcus Freeman has that environment. You know, you interviews back when he came in, he said Marcus Freeman was a huge driver, and the Al Golden even take. Yeah. I think he left pros a little bit, lucky that we podcast, but you're exactly right. Marcus Freeman was a huge reason why Al, Gold, Al Golden decided to come to Notre Dame. And with that being said, man, you have to feel really good about what he provides. 
what he provides and what his defense provides. And I think it elevates the chances of Notre Dame defensive players. I don't know why. Notre Dame defensively always felt like a very stout physical defense that was more about being don't break, keep us in the game. Now it seems more up-tempo, create turnovers, get the ball back to the offense with a Mike Denbrock now and the quarterbacks in Notre Dame that want to put points on the board quickly. Like we're not trying to waste time. We're not trying to win. Ladies and gentlemen, how we do you know Notre Dame fans, you know what we've suffered through. We gotta win time of possession. The offensive line has to be able to dominate. The offensive line has to do this. You have to control the line of scrimmage. I was just saying, left, you know how it is as a Notre Dame fan. You played in Notre Dame. Going into big games, what do we have to do? It's the same story. We got to control the line of scrimmage. Offensive line is going to have to win the day. We got to win time of possession. Now we have a defense that's trying to get the ball back to the offense, and the old feet is like, hey, we're trying to score. First play, second play, that, that time of possession? No, no, no. We're trying to make explosive plays and put points on the board. Ladies and gentlemen, Need I say, this might be a totally different Notre Dame football squad on both sides of the ball than we're used to. And I'm loving it, love. I'm absolutely loving the expectations. Yeah, I just love the fact that, you know, the, the perspective is, is, is a little different in the building. The expectations are a little bit better. The team seems to be more confident. And these are guys that are just coming in as well as guys that are on the team now. But that's also after seeing success. You see guys win awards, guys with preseason All-Americans, guys – uh, have all the potential coming into a season that, in my opinion, we had a lot of ups and, 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 and some downs. But for a program to still be revered as we are going into the season and not be in the national championship like Michigan and still being in that same conversation, uh, it just shows that Marcus Freeman has really put the groundwork in to build something pretty special that – I think everybody is kind of flourishing off of because the environment is set the right way. Our boy C. Tate said, what's up, boy? What up, he what up, what became, up, what up. Yeah, he, man, it was a big day for him, man. He just became one of the White Sox NIL deals. You know, Riley Mills, uh, Pat Coogan, Chicago area guys, also became Chicago White Sox NIL guys. Uh, the Robbie Avila kid that plays basketball for Indiana State. He's a South Side kid. And uh, Carnell Tate as well. Got that NIL deal with the Chicago White Sox, man. So I was talking to him earlier, congratulating him, checking in on him and the family. He's going to get a nice steak when he comes home in a couple of weeks for us. I'm excited about it. I'm excited about it. I'm glad. I love when I see my boys win, love. Love when I see my boys win, man. Proud of the kid. He's been through a lot the last calendar year. A whole hell of a lot. So just just happy for him. Lucky, lucky podcast. Jay, let's get back to Mike Mickens. He also had something to talk about when he talked about what's up with those red shirt freshmen. How they looking, and then how is Marty Biaggi doing? Your guy left, Coach Marty Biaggi. How is he doing in his transition working with the safeties? them to now play fast right um they've been in the system for a year um this is there's a spring to go out there and play fast and get out there a little bit you know want to see them take command of the back end and call out the checks and all those good things but then slow the game down and go react and that's what they're doing and that's what uh it's been a pleasure to see them do in the spring uh through these practices so far I think Coach Biagi spoke highly about kind of you guys' relationship. I guess how's it been getting to kind of work with him a little bit? Yeah, no, it was great. It was always great to get another guy in the back end, and uh, he's been doing good. He's been helping out uh, a lot and coaching them up, and you know we we got everybody in a big group now. But uh, you know we want to, want to continue to challenge everything. We want to email mindset, uh, deny my man, and get after it. And that's what they're doing and working hard. And you know uh, him echoing that is great. That's great. We're talking about Michael Bell at the nickel, Luke Talich, Ben Minich, back at safety. I'm just thankful that both of those young men continue to be healthy. Ben Minich last year as a, as a freshman, man, it was a tough spring. And now we get these three young men as red shirt freshmen coming in under the two of Mike Mickens. And it sounds like they're making headway, playing faster, staying healthy. Sounds fantastic, love. Yeah, I mean, 
that's what you want to see. You want to see guys come back, bounce back, and also be able to be competitive in a room that's elevated. I mean, half of this is just the fact that these guys got to kick it in gear knowing what's, what's ahead of them. So I think it's important to see uh, this development that there's a true competition that Marcus Freeman talks about all the time existing in these rooms, and, it, and it's stemming, you know, better and better play. He also talked about, as we get ready to close, with Mike Mickens and the defensive backs and switch over to left already. No. I have to start off the wide receivers. We're going to hear from head from uh, wide receiver coach Mike Brown. He's going to say some things that's going to make your antennas go up left. He's going to say some things that's going to make your antennas go up. But nothing made my antenna go up more than a particular play when it comes to the wide receivers. And he doesn't even play wide receiver. That's coming up on the back end. Of the show, but once again, Mike Mickens. Huh. Talking about once again the transition. I want you to listen to this again because I want to point something out. Yeah, it's been good. Um, you know, all of this is relationships even going even tighter and tighter together uh, with the guys in the room, and then uh, me and in there now hearing one voice with it as well. Uh, with it, you know, as before it's been separate a little bit. So they always had been a tight relationship, but now it's just everybody knows everybody and what they're doing in there and things of that nature. Did you hear that, love? I don't know if he was throwing shade to how things used to be. Not shade, but maybe sounding like, okay, it was Mike Mickens' guys that were getting a lot of love, which they were. And then it was Chris O'Leary's guys from a recruiting standpoint. It was, huh. From a play standpoint, it was uh, until Xavier Watts started to come on last year. Now it seems like, okay, now we're together. Everybody's on the same page. Everybody's getting the same teaching. Everybody's getting the same concepts. A little bit more camaraderie. A little bit more knowledge of what each other's doing. You know, maybe I'm looking too much into it. But I just thought, let me let me play this again and kind of point this out to see whether or not it actually improves what we see on the field. Can you hear me, love? Oh, I Are thought you, you had a video. No, no. No, go ahead. Oh, but yeah. I really like to see the fact that, uh, you know, what this is going to mean for the front seven. Because it has to translate in some way. I mean, we know that that was the strength towards the end of the year was the back end. But how does the front seven respond? How does Al Washington get in gear with some of these guys to to promote sacks? I saw they talked about Hassan Reddick today. He was just chasing sacks. That would sound pretty good for us. I would love if Jordan Patello just chased sacks. Who knew a defensive end would chase sacks? <laughs> who knew? Who knew? Who knew? Who What's knew? your job? What's your job? Get the quarterback. Okay. <laughs> Who knew that you could chase sacks to get a higher contract? I thought that was the point of the game. Anyway, I think that needs to exist somewhere in the Notre Dame defensive line room, and I think it would help because it would make the secondary look even better if we're getting pressure on these teams and getting the ball out quicker and making plays like they did a little bit last year. Uh, it's going to be pretty special to see. Those linebackers look beefed up. They look more uh, spruced up. They look like young chickens out there. Like they're running around hitting stuff. I saw the little clip. Max Bullock out there, you know, being the sacrificial lamb in the in the drills. And they, they popped they the hit him up. They, they, lit up. Yeah, they, they lit him up. They lit him up. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah okay. Kingston yeah, yeah. had to give him a squig of water. And yeah, he said, hold on now. Let me get a little manager at. You know, he had to call the manager over. But that's right. You know, that's they, they, they haven't gotten that. I'm a vet. Let me just be smooth and practice super. They like, oh, I'm a, uh, and, and, and then, you know, be all aggressive. So I, I really appreciate that energy being in that front seven, and it's only going to help the back end at the end of the day. Somebody caught him in the throat, boy. He was like, oh, man. Yeah, coach, you got some dogs in that room now, baby. You got some dogs in that room now. Early on, we asked fans about Cam Hart. Indy Milton fan said Cam was one of the main reasons the defense was elite last year. Appreciate you, Indy Milton fan. Jason Smith, Hart quietly had an amazing year. It was kind of quiet. It was. 
Michael Campbell says Cam Hart is a physical freak. You can't teach what his athleticism is and what NFL defensive coordinators know are rare to play day one with that Richard Sherman length. All right. Richard Sherman, that's a decent comp. It's a decent comp. I'm not mad. Richard Sherman could ball. Uh, let's see. Kudos, Matt. Cam is straight up legit. Iris Burn ends 54. Yes, Cam needed to prove he could stay healthy and quietly lock down his targets each week. Uh, Tony Gilbert says Cam's always been great. His only question is his health. Yeah, love. I can't wait to see where that young man goes in the NFL draft. Flat out. Can't wait. We'll be right back, man. On the other side, we got some stuff to talk about, Left. Somebody said something that raises the antenna on the wide receiver room. And boy, oh boy, more news from the recruiting weekend. A huge recruiting, I mean, recruiting day on yesterday, along with some practice stuff. You already know. We spin it different, man. We'll be right back. What's up, family? The merch shop is finally here. Lucky Lefty Network merch shop. We got it all. From the shirts to the hoodies to the hats to the nitty gritties. Come here right now. Shop with us. Come get the swag because you know, if anything else, we spin it different. You see the gritty. You see how we get down. It's elite. Lucky Lucky Podcast, Anora Boys in the building, Sean Davis, the original Lucky Lucky himself, Malik Zaire. Woo! I can't say it has been throwing us some fire lately. Shout out to Jay Illa, official DJ of the Chicago Bears, lighting it up right here. Lucky Lucky Podcast, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, CFB Nation, audio edibles each and every day. Don't forget patreon.com forward slash Lucky Lucky Network. We got a special episode of Three's Company coming up a little bit later. We're going to give Ken Gibbs a little time to talk that wolf pack talk because he can't talk it come football season. He, yeah, he has to shut up come football season. He had to wait for the hard court. He had to wait for the hard court. The hardwood, bro. Hard court is tense. I'm sorry. He had to wait for the hardwood. That's the only time he can get it off. He can definitely get it off. He can get it off. Well, Isaiah James, DJ Burns, both wolf packs in the final four, men, men and women. We're going to let him get his stuff off tonight. We're going to let him talk his stuff, talk his ish. We're going to let him. We're going to let him get it off. El, El Nation, he deserves it, man. Because he's been, we've been talking Notre Dame over his head all year long. So we're going to give him his 15 minutes of fame tonight, love. Lucky Lefty Podcast. YouTube, subscribe, share. The thumbs up, smash it for us. It helps with the views, notification bell. Every time we go live or post something, you will know. Home of the misguided passion, still to this day. Yeah, we still feel like we called. So part of the reason the email came out, that's the way we feel. And we're forever committed to making sure. That's right. That we continue to spin it different. different. You didn't go too deep into it, left. Are you cool? Like wearing a brace in practice, still throwing, not really participating in live action. I don't know, left. Can I keep it funky? Can I keep it funky? Was it for the cameras, left? He's not doing anything. He's not bad. We don't know. If we, we, we're we praying and we're hoping. because We just need him for the fall. Man. That's it. We need him ready to go at College Station. That's all we need. So right now, throwing right now don't mean a darn thing to me. 
because you don't even have your full support. You're still limping around. I, I just think he's in a helpless position, man. That's what I said. Just enjoy your two million. Go home. I wouldn't even show up. I just, I'll be in the like Batman when he when remember when Batman got beat up by Bane and mm -hmm. he just stayed gone. Just stay gone. Optimus Prime, just stay gone. And then what does Optimus Prime always do? Somehow somebody sends a signal out there. They contact him. They find the key. You know. You said we did an hour of Bumblebee. Our uh, Bumblebee, Bumblebee the show. Steve Angeli's Bumblebee. Kenny Minchie, Bumblebee. That's who the story really be about, you know. And then here come Optimus Prime. Somehow somebody's found him. Right, he right. simple. And he, and he pops up and, and, and has some value. So that's really what we're expecting. So it's like what he's doing now is, is, is just half of, half of nothing. And if anything, you in the way. Get out the way. You should do all that when nobody's in there because mm -hmm. you're just out there tossing the football. You're a civilian. So if I was him, I'd be on that ice pack, that therapy, whatever you need. Really, uh, really get it, uh, get it together because, you know, that's going to help. You stand on your ankle when you're not supposed to because you know you the boot hurt and it hurts too. You know, you fight through the pain. So it's just better if you uh, go get healthy, man. You're not no Tim Tebow. We're not, we're not praising every little thing you're doing. You got to earn it around here. So I think the best thing he can do is just go ahead and just watch film and, and, and get some ice. Man, like what? You, you hurting yourself because it takes 21 days to get 21, you know. They 20, 20 days, you know bars. what I'm saying? Keep, yeah, keep putting those bars to the side to send to your boy. You keep coming up with bars. Maybe he can actually come up with a verse of 16 if you keep giving him some, you know, every now and then. He, he ain't worried about it. I know he's not worried. He, he brought that cat push out. That cat push came out and said something else. Mm -hmm. Kryptonite. That's that boy Kryptonite right there. The Virginia boys, the Virginia boys, that kryptonite. I'm not worry, man. I know, I know. Yeah, because he, you know, because he has, you know, he has, he has the ear, he has the look, he has everything you need to stay up top. He don't want no parts. He's like Washington and their offensive line. You know what I'm saying? That offensive line that won the award for the best offensive line, but they ain't won no parts of that Michigan defensive line when it was all said and done, and vice versa. That defense didn't want no parts of that Michigan offensive line. That's mm -hmm. Drake and Pusha T. He looked real cute out there on the West Coast. That's where he is in Calabasas. Real okay. cute out there in Pac-12. Okay. He real cute out there. He don't want nothing to do. What happened to them boys? I'll let you. He don't want nothing with them Virginia boys and them birds. You don't want nothing with them birds, we're gonna boys. See. We're going to see. We're going to see. Youngin. Youngin. <laughs> Lucky, lucky podcast. So, look, let me tell you something. The wide receivers continue to look absolutely amazing in practice. And before we hear from Mike Brown, this is what should get your antennas up. Would you like to hear a direct quote? Left, direct quote. Flat out, direct quote. This is from... Defensive back, Christian Gray. You like Christian Gray, don't you? You think he's a pretty good athlete. You say you think he's a first-round talent athletically, don't you, love? Would you like to hear what Christian Gray said when he was asked about the wide receivers? Hey, you remember when uh, your boy, Braden Lindsey, was asked about the quarterbacks and Tyler Buckner? What did he say? What did he say, love? He's the a best – Fastest runner, best runner I've ever seen. What? Hey, how's your quarterback, man? What's it like playing and catching the ball from your quarterback, man? He's, hey, man, his legs are amazing. Bird? Christian Gray. What's it been like covering the transfer wide receivers in spring ball? Wow. 
I've never seen this before. Woo! Wait a minute. Hold on. <laughs> Wait a minute. Real simple, left. Real simple, straight to the point. Let's get real deep with it. He said, hmm, wow. Paused, contemplated. Yeah. I was covering him. I was like, yo, yeah, I ain't. Never seen this. Never seen this. And no, never seen 4 3 at Notre Dame. Mm -mm. And this is the kicker. If Chris Mitchell's one in 4 3, and the wide receivers agree that Jaden Harrison is the fastest wide receiver. What do you think Jaden Harrison is running? Yeah. Think about that. Think, think about that, ladies and gentlemen. Jaden Harrison is pretty much unanimous amongst the receiving room that, oh, yeah, Jaden's the fast. And Chris Mitchell is out here like, y'all, don't call me a 4-4 four -four dude. Hey, man. And then you have your – What Bush say? We got him. We got him. Mm -hmm. We got him. Yeah. Do we got him? We just got to see if we can throw it to him. We said a lot of people – look, Jordan Faison, his short area quickness, along with the speed he does have, phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. Jordan Faison might be the fourth or fifth fastest dude in the room. Yeah, year. fourth or fifth. Fourth or fifth. Because Cam Williams isn't slow. Cam Williams is not slow. Cam Williams, now we'll, I've been talking, Micah, Mil, Micah Gilbert is smoother right now. I've been saying Micah that. Micah probably track. runs like a four or five maybe. Yeah, Micah Gilbert's probably four or five, but he's so smooth, so quick. Cam, Cam could definitely get sub four or four. Sub four or four. Right, Cam is not as smooth yet, especially with the route running. But if you just ask Cam, run a fly, run a post, take this jet sweep, oh, you got some problems. You got some problems. So speed and redundancy in the wide receiver room with wide receivers that can only do the same things, which ended up because of injury being a major issue last year. Definitely don't see that being an issue this year. And for Christian Gray to say that, Christian Gray has been making, man, one of the clips they put out for Christian Gray earlier this week. He makes a play where he's coming across the field. This is the first practice. We're there. Jaden Harrison is running the over route. He's wide open. You know how fast Jaden Harrison is. Wide open. They throw the ball. This cat, Christian Gray, makes up the ground and gets a PBU. And I'm looking like, Ladies and gentlemen, I'm look, I'm trying not to be, I'm not trying to exaggerate. But I'm telling you, I do, I've been there the last three years. I haven't seen this. I haven't seen stuff like this the last three years. Just haven't. First of all, the speed, I haven't seen it. Have you seen it? The, the defensive backs being challenged and then stepping up to the challenge. I'm like, okay. All right. It's truly a battle at practice. Yes, the way it should be. That's the way it should be, love. Absolutely. Lucky left the podcast. Let's see, love. Mike Brown. Let's see. I'll go with this one. Mike Brown. Your receivers. How do you think they've been picking up things? And what's the first thing you noticed about the wide receivers when you arrived in Notre Dame? Coach, what have you just kind of learned about this receiver group after being here three months? Yeah, smart. Yeah, smart and competitive. Um, so I'm, I'm enjoying it, man. It's a good group of young men. Uh, they work really hard. Uh, they're eager to learn. And uh, man, they're a real joy to work with. And then you have several guys who can play multiple spots. I guess how do you kind of figure out which spot's best for them? Yeah, you know, it's going to kind of just depend on them, right? We're throwing guys, throwing a lot of different guys, seeing how much they can handle. Um, trying to find, you know, who are the top five, six guys, and then we'll put them in the positions that uh, to, to be the most successful. So um, that's what we're trying to learn over over spring ball, you know, trying to get them to learn the offense as a whole uh, to give us some flexibility to move guys around. And then, um, you know, as, as they're doing that, we'll figure out what each one of them is good at. And, uh, you know, come game day, we'll put them in the best positions to succeed. 
Mm. You like what you hear from Mike Brown? Yeah, being able to move guys around because these guys are smart and can be versatile, that's going to add the ultimate threat to a defense that is about matchups. So being able to – we've always been smart. <laughs> but we now are matching the talent with the smarts and being able to put something together. So I think, you know, he's adjusting to the fact that this is a equally talented group. Now it's about popping out those stars and putting people in the right place, the best fit. Let me be petty for a second. You remember the bull crap two years ago when they told us that or tried to insinuate somehow, some way intelligence was an issue with Tobias Merriweather? Well, why, why isn't Tobias in the game? Why is he getting snaps? Well, you know, he has to know the playbook. Was that bull crap left? Was that bull? I'll, I'll leave it to you to tell me. Probably bull. Most of the time, because come on, it's football. It ain't like, now there's some hard classes at Notre Dame, and football ain't one of them. <laughs> so, you know, if anything, that's a walk in the park. Get some hard class. He, he probably don't understand some stuff in the classroom, and I can get that. Hell, anybody does. But I do think that the excuses aren't going to be there because the talent's there. We're having the conversation of, hell, I can't put all these guys in at one time. They're not talking nothing about no playbook. They're talking about, oh, we're just trying to figure out the, the hierarchy in this. Like, are we going to put him in this time? We're switch him off. You're not hearing the lame duck excuses mm -hmm. that coaches like to make because they're not utilizing their players to the best of their ability. You recruited them there. What do you mean? There's not no standardized tests. They're not getting real estate exams or taking the MCAT where it's, 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 it's one way. This is your recruited player. So if you're recruiting, find the fit for him. Mm. Call his strengths. Do what he's good at. Why are you making this you don't fit into a thing that I brought you here for? That's stupid. Mike Brown's like, all oh, these guys are good. Hell, we're just trying to figure out, because they are very uh, smart or whatever, we now just got to figure out what the formula is. What best combination fits, personnel, whoop de -woo. They can all take a jet sweep. They can all run this type of route. They know how to play inside and out. We're trying to be very complex but simple as an offense because it's about matchups. Well, we've gone from players researching releases on YouTube, as John Massey points out, to our wide receivers having a release package. And now we have a wide receiver coach that's saying, like, yo, I'm, hey, we're going to find a spot. They're going to play. They're going to play. You know, and he also said, and let me know if this is a good number. He said going, he's expecting six guys to play on Saturdays. That sound good to you? Absolutely, because you got to think we got running backs too. <laughs> Jeremiah Love and Ananias Williams being yeah, interested part of it. Yeah, so it got to be six, you know, and that's that's a competitive six. Mm. Competitive six. And so that's yeah. in the back of everybody's mind too because somebody got to – Somebody gonna be upset. Hey, it is what it is. Lucky Lucky Podcast. Somebody's going to be mad. I'm not mad at it. How are the vets looking? Jay Thomas, Deion Cozy. What can you get out of them, Coach Brown? And outside of his speed, what does Chris Mitchell kind of bring to the table? Uh, leadership, man. He's done it. You know, he's done it, and you know, he's done it at a very high level. You know, for for several years now. And so him bringing that veteran uh, presence to the room and that leadership, and you know, he's a guy that leads by example. He's not overly vocal. He's vocal when he needs to be. Um, that's been a, a real good help for us in the room. Coach, the guys like uh, Dion and JT, how do you want to see them kind of step up since they've been in the program and they kind of can change a little bit? 
Yeah, yeah those two, man, they've done an outstanding job. Because those are the guys that have been here, right? They've been around. Um, they know what the expectations are. They know, um, you know, how things go around here. And they've done a really, really good job of embracing that role and leading the young guys and um, challenging the young guys. And so I'm very, very happy with, with that from them. But then also, you know, you, you look at JT. JT's done some things to, to really change his body around and he's moving a lot better and things like that. And, you know, Dion's done a really good job of just learning. And, you know, we challenged him and just moving him around in different spots as well. So uh, both of those guys have been very, very uh, good for us so far in spring ball. Hey, man, can we say a prayer for Dion Cozy? You know, I'm being serious. I'm being dead serious, love. Right now, I just want to speak divine health over that young man. Flat out. Divine health in a prosperous senior year at Notre Dame. I speak it. I speak it. Notre Dame fans, if you receive it, say it is so, man. If you agree with it, say it is so. Because I, that young man, that young man, man, I, I feel awful for him. And it's always been a little nagging, nagging, some nagging injury. Man. I really think he can make an impact if he's helped. The way it sounded. Okay, give it it to us, love. Give it to us like you only can. I know it's it's a food analogy coming or something. Didn't sound too good. He said the vets were challenging the young guys. That just sounds off to me. Mm. If your vets are your guys. You saying the young guys are trying to keep up? They teaching the they teaching the young guys. This is they challenging. They they they, they know that this is wide open. This is this is an open playing field. There's no tenure in this. Mm. This is an open arena. No loyalty. Now loyalty would help to uh, Dion Cozy and JT's case. But hell, they ain't even talking about both. So this is just a matter of, I think, the team is getting in that transition phase. It's the last year of some of these guys, just like Aldrich's last year, had to be what it was. Because mm-hmm. we're going into something where guys are coming in like, we ain't worried about changing our body. The body right. <laughs> Off the bus. Off the bus, getting to know that ain't the body right. I ain't got to change the body. I ain't got to learn new tricks. I ain't got to change my game. The game's ready to play tomorrow where these vets are like, okay, I got this a couple weeks here. I'm going to just – it's going to be hard to just come on back. Mm-hmm. It's going to – we got guys that are the fastest on the, in the unit right now that ain't even ain't even took a test yet. Mm. Don't even know everything where everything's on campus yet. Couldn't tell you what a bookstore from the cafeteria was. That's what you got to deal with, right? So this is the, you know, in certain cultures, they walk the elders all the way to the middle of the forest when mm-hmm. they get to a certain age and leave them there. Because it's about that time to transition. We're not going, we're not going, we're not going to do you wrong now. We're just going to let you pass on. See, that's the beautiful thing I love about that culture that I, I wish we really still had is that our elders stayed in the household. And then, you know, you give them that solemn moment when they're close to transitioning. You know, because, man, that's why we have these money makers that we call senior homes. Literally are nightmares if you really knew what happened to your loved ones in those particular places. But the value of the wisdom of the elders, man, and that's the value probably Jaden Thomas and Deion Cozy. Jaden Thomas more from being able to play, being a go-to guy at certain points during his time in Notre Dame. Uh, but I love what he said about Chris Mitchell. That dude all business. He ain't, he ain't talking. Yeah, yeah, he, he said, he said, Chris Mitchell, been there, been there, done that. Been there, done that. He said it about the other two. No. He said, they, he's leading by example. He's been there, done that. He know what. He's been making plays. Glad to have him. The mother, mm-hmm. too, we bringing them along, trying them in different spots. They're eating better. What do you say? They- JT cut, cut, his, cut his dreadlocks off. 
Man mentioning all non-football stuff. Man eating good. He and cleaned his locker up. Picking up trash, letting the younger guys know that's how we clean the room. But Chris he's Mitchell, he's like, no, nah, he's been there, done that. He's stupid. <laughs> like Chris Mitchell, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He out there leading drills, making one hand. You said one hand kick? Yeah, he's doing all that. He's doing all that. So I think that you got to read between the lines on these things. But it's also just showing that the Notre Dame receiver room is not like the years before. It's only a matter of time. Mm-hmm. And the t- and the window is not waiting and holding open for you to fly through. That thing doing this the whole time, like the movies. Tomb Raider, they run under there, try to slide right under. That's what, that's what they're doing right now. That 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 rock wall about to close, they just, oh, oh, oh this one of them moves. You yeah. get right on underneath, because when it closes, it's over with. Because the type of guys we're bringing in, our guys that we expect to play on Sunday. Mm-hmm. Coming out the package. Here's a question, love. T Texas N D says, TXND says, who was our last sub for four wide receiver? Hmm. The wheel run hey, sub four four? Was what do you think Brady was sub four four though? I'm sure EQ was a four three. No. Chase, Chase was a four three. No. Miles was a 4-3. Four, 4-4. Four, four. No. no, Miles was 4-4. Four, four. Uh, Kevin Stefferson might have been 4-3. I mean, we got, like, that's the that's, thing. That, that might have been 4-3. The fact that we got to really think about it because we never saw yeah. it on the field yet. Yeah, yeah. Here, Georgia just put out Lad McConkey at, like, 4-4-1. Four, 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 you know what I'm saying? A dude that we probably look at and say, well, he's going to end up going in the first round back in probably. That's crazy. That's crazy. That's crazy. And then the Georgia wide receivers, they just win titles and then go get the NIL. <laughs> Let me Thanks. commit to Georgia. Commit to Georgia, win the title, and then go get this NIL back. Kill from the Texas. Spurs and one stuff. Yes, from Texas. Texas specifically. <laughs> and they get drafted in the first round. That's what's up, Adonai Mitchell. I see you, yep. AD. I yep. see you. That's the blueprint. All right, Isaiah Bond. Yeah, he jumped in the portal from Alabama. He went to Texas, right? Did Isaiah Bond yep. go to Texas? Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's oh, the blueprint. Man. man. Last one from my guy, Mike Brown. What's up with the freshman? And that dude, uh, that Christian Gray was probably talking about the most covering, Jaden Harris. What's up with those guys? Yeah, that's a challenge, right? And and so I think that's what we're looking to figure out through spring balls, right? You know, what's his role going to be? How big is his role going to be? Um, how, how many different spots can we move him to, right? He's obviously a guy that um, has some dynamic ability, and uh, we got to figure out the best ways to use him and uh, figure out, you know, how many different things he can handle. So um, yeah, it'll, be, it'll be a good little project. It'll be fun for us. Coach, is there any specific progression you want to see from Mike and Cam from uh, spring practice one to the spring game? Yeah, I mean, these guys are supposed to be in high school right now. And so, um, you know, just to see them come in and just learn, 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 right? Learn how to be a college athlete, right? Learning the playbook and then continuing to learn the things that we're teaching them in the receiver room. Um, and then applying those things. And I think both of them have done a really, really good job, right? All high school guys that come in, they start at different levels. You know, some of them ran similar offenses to what we're doing, and some of them it's, you know, it's brand new. And so uh, you try to reel them in and try to get everybody to, to get on the same page, understand the expectations of being a college uh, student, a college athlete, and then, um, you know, just going and, and applying that as we roll. Hmm. First of all, he was talking about Jaden Harrison at the start of that clip. He's so dynamic. They just have to find ways to give him the ball. What's the last dude we had like that in the wide receiver? Like, yo, he's, we just got to find a way to give him the ball. Been a while. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are really, truly not trying. We are purposely trying not to oversell the talent at wide receiver and how it's changed. Maybe you will. Where you're just like, man, we gotta, we gotta get him like mm-hmm. ten targets. 
Yeah. Other than that, ain't been nobody, man. Mm-hmm. Maybe Kate, Kevin Stefferson just didn't play long enough. Other than that. Yeah, because all Stefferson did is catch touchdowns when he played. Yeah. Period. Like every game he played. Touchdown. Yeah. So, can't really think of any in-demand receiver we have. So, we'll see what happens moving forward. Man, yeah, we'll see, man. We'll see. But I'm excited to hear. Yeah, Michael Gilbert and Cam are literally supposed to be getting ready for prom, bro. And then learn the finer points of playing wide receiver at a place like Notre Dame from a really good wide receiver coach, in my opinion. So that's going to help them out. And like I said, Michael Gilbert just stepped right now. This pure all-around wide receiver, the final points, I would probably say he's a little bit ahead of Ken. The actual explosiveness and, like, just ceiling. This man. Who was it? I think it was I, – I want to say it was CJ in the first practice. Cam ran a post on Chance Tucker. And you know how they say when you even, as a wide receiver, throw your hands up? I swear, Cam threw his hands up at least a half a step before he got even. Yeah. And Brian – B. Drift was next to me and was like, yo, he when he learns how to run that route better, it's going to be worse. <laughs> it was like, he was like, dude, he, he didn't even run it clean. That wasn't even a clean route. That's just him and his speed. I think he got maybe was like getting right to chance. And, just like, and they threw the ball too late. Chance had a, had an opportunity to catch up, but it's like, yo, you're seeing that from like the freshman in practice. I already told you, Chris Mitchell, Chris Mitchell could have after the first practice, Chris Mitchell could have walked off and dropped the mic. And be like now, I see y'all in the fall. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. He, I'm telling you, he caught every route on the route tree. Didn't make a difference. Short, intermediate, long, didn't make a difference. He literally could have walked off and was like, all right, I'll see y'all in the fall, my dudes. That's right. I remember I called you and I was like, okay, he a dude. He wanted, he, he's a dude. He, man, he jumped it off. It, like he knew it was full access that day. He knew it was recruits in the stands. He knew it was parents in the stands, full media. He was like, okay, let's go. I'm about to show y'all. Y'all think I'm 4-4? Watch this. Yeah. I was like, all right, dude. I'm going to shut my mouth. I, I'll see you in the fall when you can prove it. You still have to prove it to us. Not, nothing, much, nothing else for me to say. That's right. Nah. And they seem to be gaining confidence too, left. Yeah. The room seems to be a confident group. I think Jade Harrison is like the shock to everybody. Because I really think they went and got Jade Harrison because he's an elite yeah. kick returner and punt, punt return. They went yeah. and got him for a return. And we're like, okay, whatever we can get from this young man in the wide receiver room, it's like icing on the cake. And then they messed around and got a dude in the slot that can do damage. That the wide receiver coach is like, oh, we're going to have to get this dude the ball. Yahtzee. Yeah. We doing something right now. We're cooking. Uh, that's a good, yeah. That cooking. They're cooking Lucky Lucky Podcast. So, some big-time recruits were on campus. We start with Coco, Florida, 2026 quarterback, Brady Hart. We have an interview that we did with, I did with Ryan Roberts 
and Brady Hart up over at IB. You can go check it out. Uh, the young man is absolutely a super cool kid, left. And I'm not talking about the group out of Chicago, the hip hop duo. I'm not talking about them. This dude is really a cool customer, bro. I like this young man a lot. And for him to say, yo, I know I'm coming behind Deuce, and that's the type of wide receiver room I want to come up into. I said, okay, as long as you know, as long as you know, as long as you know what you're stepping into and you're not afraid of it, sounds good to me. Yeah. Jadon Blair. And I'm sorry, Brady Hart had an absolute. Brady Hart visit phenomenal. Phenomenal. I'll just leave it at that, love. Phenomenal. That's how the visit went. Then I saw a picture of another NFL great in the building. It just gave me chills, love. I'm sorry. All these NFL greats and their sons starting to show up in Notre Dame for visits. It's giving me chills, left boy. That cat Thomas Davis was in the building, left with Thomas Davis Jr. Mm. That cat TD. Oh, you know what I mean? Yeah. TD was in good the good building with his youngster. Very good to see. Very good to see. And of course, with Marcus Freeman being a linebacker himself, I'm sure the conversation was great. I'm sure, the visit went well. We're waiting for more intel on that. But it was just good to see Thomas Davis in the building checking out the practice and him and his son watching practice together it looked like they were focused on something intently you'd love to see it tristan phillips talented linebacker in the 26th class off the west coast this young man was in the building he had a fabulous time absolutely fabulous time they had a 27 quarterback that we're going to have to check out daniel milky daniel milky the second quarterback in 2027 he was in the building as well. Braden Hop, wide receiver from out there, 2025. This 25 wide receiver thing might be heating up. We're going to check out some film on a kid coming up here shortly. That's a connection to a visitor that was on campus. And we're going to end things with the two stud defensive recruits. Noah McHale, his third visit to Notre Dame. You know, it's going to be a task to get him from the West Coast, especially with the resurgence of USC and their defensive recruiting and the step they, they, they've they taken as they come to the Big Ten. Oregon is after this kid. But I really believe in Max Bullock and Al Golden, and I think the Notre Dame fight and I will stay in this until the end. They, they probably make his list of finalists, and it's going to be a battle. Oregon, Notre Dame, USC, we'll see if they come out top. J. Don Blair was on campus. Now, this is the thing. J. Don Blair was supposed to come in. He was supposed to come in for a day and possibly a day and a half. They turned it into a multi-day, possibly two to three days from what we're hearing. Him and his family got in after the practice. They got in yesterday evening. They stayed over today, and it sounds like they're going to stay over until the weekend on Saturday, which is huge. Ladies and gentlemen, this young man will complete what could be the best safety class, the absolute best safety class since, man, going back to maybe the Lou Hopes days, to be honest. We're talking about Ethan Long, Ivan Taylor, and getting Jadon Blair in this safety class, and Mike Mickens. Man, God bless your hands, my brother. God bless your hands. Whatever it is that makes you special in the recruiting circles. Do your magic this weekend. Jadon Blair, Penn State, Notre Dame. That's the battle from everything we're hearing. Penn State, Notre Dame. Penn State, Notre Dame. Felt really good. Chris O'Leary really might have had this one in the bag. Jadon Blair was very up, up front. Then when Chris O'Leary departed, you know, he had to take a step back and look at things. But with Mike Nickens becoming the coach of the entire defensive backfield, and what he's been able to do, you have to feel really good. And J. Don Blair comes down with his family to check everything out. And hopefully he's trying to solidify what he already felt about Notre Dame, in my opinion, which Notre Dame gets the second to last official visit from the kid. 
Early June is when he makes his final announcement. Penn State gets the last crack at him. But I think Notre Dame sits um, in a really, really good spot. Uh, Carl A., you're wrong because Riley Leonard is still limping. He had a brace on and was limping. So what's changed? Nothing's changed. And if I was wrong, Irish Breakdown was wrong. Irish Illustrated was wrong. Because everybody reported the beginning of a fracture. Where do you think everybody just made that up? We all just decided, let's just make it up. Riley Leonard has the beginning of a fracture in his foot. Let's just all collectively, let's get on this Zoom call, this conference call, make it up. This is what we're going to report. We reported what came from the program. And I don't care. This is why I said this is photo op, in my opinion, because he's not gaining anything from throwing with a brace on his foot. He can do that outside of practice with the quarterbacks. He can do that on his own. Dude, you don't have to. Don't worry about the fan base. Just get the man healthy. I don't care what the op is. I don't care what the photos are. As long as he shows up in College Station healthy, game one, that's all that matters. That's all that matters because he's not playing. He didn't go live. He's not going to go live, not limping around. I of course, see him going live during the spring. He's still limping around. It was evident. So the dude that was trying to act like, oh, it's nothing, he's still limping. He still has the brace on. And he didn't participate outside of throwing the ball. That's it. So, no, I don't think anybody was wrong. Because everything the man said, he made it seem like he's good. He'll be back. He's not back. He stood there practicing and threw the ball 10 to 15 yards and went and sat down. That's all he did. That's all he did. They took a photo. Riley Leonard's back. No, he's not. He didn't participate in practice. He threw in warm ups. That's all he did. That's all he did. And look, it's hyperbole for those that were acting like we threw the ball great. It's like based upon what? He, he threw the ball great based upon what? There was warm-ups. He did not participate in practice. That's what's that's why I was kind of misleading the way people kind of report. Because he didn't participate in live action. He didn't. When the quarterbacks were throwing for one on one, one on ones. No. Warm ups. That's it. That's not practicing. That's like somebody walking out on the basketball court with a boot on and shooting free throws. That's not practicing. You're not guarding anybody. You're not running plays. You're not going through drills. You didn't practice. You warmed up with the team. That's what you did. So to take a photo of that and try to insinuate that he returned to practice when he did it. Mm. Mm. I'm sorry, I'm not. I'm not selling that. Maybe some. Maybe everybody else is gonna sell that. I'm not selling that. Nope. If I go to full access next week, and he comes out of the huddle, and he's live, running around, which I doubt he will be, based upon the prognosis of the procedure that was done, which is a three to four week procedure, which Malik has had himself. And it's telling you what needs to happen. Mm. 
Carl, stop lying. Nobody said he was missing the summer. This is what I'm talking about. Stop lying. Go back and watch the show. Nobody said he was going to miss the summer. I flat out said he was missing the spring. Clearly. Don't do that, man. Don't do that. You can disagree, but don't lie to me and say what I said when I didn't say it. That's a flat out lie. I never said that. No one on this podcast said he was missing the summer. What are you talking about? We flat out said he needs to sit out for the spring so he could be ready for the fall. And left flat out said he's going to be behind the other quarterbacks in the fall because he's not getting reps. Stop. Man, Marvin, dude, I just don't like that, man. I'm all for disagreement and conversation, man. But don't just flat out lie. Don't do that. Commander Lou, man, I'm not. Wait, what are we talking about, man? You brought this food. Why do you keep harping on the same stuff, asking the same dumb question when you've had several Notre Dame fans answer the question? I'm not. That's a stupid question. That's dumb. Go find the proof. That's why I don't rock with other podcasts that try to, like, sneak this, pull that sneak this stuff and lie and make up stuff. People on message boards and didn't have no proof. Goofies. That's a perfect intro, man. Perfect intro, love. But what we're about to get into, you already know what time it is. Very cold. It's time to get petty. Oh, we did a good job executing. Are you upset with something? And fire up the Petticoat Junction train. I just don't like you. You don't? No. What is today's petty historic Petty Junction? Petty Junction, Petty Story today brought to you by Nora Whiskey and NoraWhiskey.com, that premium American whiskey, NoraWhiskey.com. I'm an intelligent dude with a doctor degree, my brother. That little, the way you're trying to go about it, take that to somebody with a GED. Lucky Lefty Podcast. Gilbert Arenas, you guys are spot on with this. Man, I look. I don't know. His issue with Nikola Jokic, man, is comical to me at this point, man. Like, I, look, you might not like the style of play. You might not like the least amount of flash, winning MVPs. That's fine and dandy, man. But to just flat out discredit someone, it's the same people that try to discredit uh, what people talking about Derrick Rose. First, it was Derrick Rose who was the worst MVP Ever. Now it's Nikola Jokic is the worst MVP. It's who I've never seen someone perform to a level to be considered for the most valuable player of the National Basketball Association. And then have someone that's never even come close to being in the top five or four in voting denigrate their efforts and their resume. It's like comical. Like, who does that? And, like, the the extent that people go to or will go to to establish silliness in this time and age is, like, I man, I really, when he was talking, I said, he, there's no way, there's no way he's hearing himself say this. Like, you know, everyone has a check. Like, you hear yourself when you're talking. And inside, you're saying, oh, man, did I say that even as you talk? But flat out, that's absolutely what he said was absolutely just heinous as far as a take on MVPs. Like, how do you tell someone that's an MVP, like, you're the worst? You're the worst. Like, 
what just to even be considered that's like saying Jokic is probably a leader for the MVP this year him Luca Shea Gilgis Ant-Man will probably be top five who am I missing Giannis will probably get some votes MB was injured most of the year good to see the big man back Heck of a performance against OKC the other night as well. Good to see a big man back from Philly. But yeah, Gilbert, Ren Gilbert Arenas was all the way out of pocket. Uh, Mr. Ocho over at Fox Sports. Now, Lef and I, we said what we said the other day about the Angel Reese press conference and the situation. Now, I actually had some friends of mine reach out to me after they watched the show disagree with me i got coach vic who's constantly watching us we appreciate you coach vic um i stand on what i stand on with the situation but there is another layer that i will like to give credit to my brother brian crawford who works for cbs sports up there out of philadelphia the philadelphia affiliate of cbs he opened up my eyes to a situation and not that it was something that we didn't say that we probably should have said in all honesty about the situation and that's not to minimize in any way shape or form uh, her emotions or her feelings and it's definitely not cool for anyone in any situation to receive death threats that's never cool Never. I don't care what's been done. It's not cool for anyone to receive death threats, right? But it was just our thought, you know, you have been this person the entire time. And, you know, my bigger issue when he pointed that out and he was like, you know, you sound like you're trying to legislate her feelings and when they come and how she speaks about them. I was like, no, I'm not legislating that at all. I said, yo, and, and I would be interested in left because I think left had to jump on a conference call right quick. I would be interested in uh, uh, in seeing who is her support system, right? Who is her support system and who is around her? And I say this, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, right? Someone around her when she did what she did to Caitlin Clark, who is without question the media darling, without question she is the media darling of women's college basketball. For her to do what she did to her in front of millions of people in this country at a time where the country is literally divided on several fronts in order for her to do that to the media darling and not to expect backlash that you just you thought it was going to be sweet after you did that you thought that story wouldn't come up again for the rematch you thought those emotions wouldn't be dredged up again that some the people around you are doing you a disservice and then wait a minute just to show you and i'm not legislating what she does and i'm not hating on the back somebody around you should tell you okay you just did a full press conference talking about how you've been sexualized and how much it hurt but you're going to announce leaving lsu to go to the nba via a photo shoot in Vogue? It, the optics, man. The optics. The people around her, in my opinion, are using her for the moment. And they're not even worried about the optics and how it makes her look. But they leave, they leave her alone to take the backlash. That's what I hate. They're around her. To benefit off of her. But then when the time comes for the backlash, they leave her hanging. 
You don't hear from anyone. The only per Flo J spoke up with her or spoke up for her in the press conference, which is absolutely amazing, supporting her sister the way she did. But I'm more concerned about the support system. Who's around her? Because she went blindly into this entire year thinking that nobody was going to say anything to her. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Heck, I got backlash the following day after the national championship game on this podcast when I said, yo, that's hoops. Let them play. Her doing that wasn't a big deal. Caitlin Clark waving off the girl for South Carolina wasn't a big deal. That's trash talking. That's hoops. It's going to cause the game to grow. And it, that's exactly what it did. What did I say? Leave it alone. Neither one of them needs to be, be protected. It's going to cause the game to grow, and they're going to benefit from it next year. And that's exactly what happened. That's exactly what happened. But if she really thought that she wasn't going to catch any backlash or any fire from that situation, she doesn't have anybody around her. And this is the other thing. I'm not sitting here debating right for wrong. Death threats, even being men, she deserves the right to put on a swimsuit or do anything without being sexualized or receiving nasty comments. That's not right either. I'm not condoning any of that. But baby girl, somebody around you needs to open your eyes to the reality of this world and where it is right now. Because you're still a little big, you're a little, still a little green, still a little naive. You're still a little green, you're still a little naive. But I'm gonna be praying for you, man. I really am, I really am. And the mock draft says that the Chicago Sky more than likely are gonna end up drafting you. I welcome you to Chicago. Chicago, look, if you're all about brand, now you're going to have to win. Candace Parker came here and won. You're going to have to come here and win. Don't just come here trying to get the bag. You have to come here and win in this city. But I wish you nothing but the best. You know, by no means did what we say have anything to do with us condoning the things you were talking about, the unfortunate things that were being done, said, and being put on you, young lady. I have a young daughter that's the same age as you. I understand. He's going into a field that's full of dirty dudes in more ways than one. But you better believe her support staff has told her this is what to expect. You're not getting caught off guard. Don't have a spec fantasy of L.A., that word, the glitz and glamour. These are the sharks. This is what they want. And this is what you're not going to do to get to where you want to go. And it's obvious that no one around this young lady prepared her for what was to come over the past year. And that, my friends, is the saddest thing the saddest thing about this story, along with the fact that death threats and all of that type of foolishness over a college basketball game. But I've seen worse. I've seen worse on football fields watching games with seven, eight, nine-year-olds, flat out. I'm going to be honest, ladies and gentlemen, small for our basketball. I've seen worse. I flat out seen worse. So I'm not shocked at all. I'm not shocked at all. It's just sad, man. And as we always say on this podcast, regardless of how you feel, regardless of where we, whether we agree or disagree, just, man, just love on each other and respect each other. That's it. That's it. Just love on each other and respect each other, man. That's it. That's it. She was out at the uh, Pelicans game last night having a ball, so it, it looked like she was feeling a lot better. 
I'm going to keep it a buck. As distraught as she was after that game, she looked like she was having a fantastic time in New Orleans at that New Orleans Pelicans game. Looking forward to that Vogue shoot that she had just done along with her announcement. <laughs> she looked pretty darn happy. That's all I'm saying. I'm not trying to insinuate every, anything. It looked like she's resilient and she got over whatever emotion she had and she got it all out. That's what, that's what I took from it. She got it all, everything she had been holding up and pinning up for a year, she got it out. Now it's out. She can move on to the WNBA. He comes to Chicago. I'll definitely root for her. And I, man, wish nothing but the best for her and the rest of the young ladies as they move on. Paige Beckers, Caitlin Clark, it's going to be a really impressive draft class. Nothing but the best for all of them. They have done a tremendous job. All of them have done a tremendous job expanding the game of basketball for women. They've done a fantastic job. Job well done. All of you understood the assignment and you fulfilled it. And now we look forward to, I think it's going to be two great games coming up. South Carolina, North Carolina State, it's going to be a good game. I really expect it to be a good game. And then Connecticut, I think Connecticut doesn't have enough depth. They can slow it down, keep the pace down. Maybe they have a shot. Maybe they allow Paige to make some plays late in that game to get the victory. But ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something. If LSU, if LSU and Iowa broke the record, what do you think South Carolina and Iowa is about to do in the championship game? If LSU versus I broke records in the Elite Eight. Ho oh, ho! Championship game Sunday night. South Carolina best team, best player. Iowa. Oh, that record is about to be broken. That record is going to stand for for eight days. That's it. That record is definitely about to be broken. Man, that cat Commander Luke is wilding out. I don't know, man. Go grab the Snickers, bro. You, you wilding out today, man. I don't know what's going on with you, man. You are on a tirade. You're on a tirade. Lucky Lucky Podcast. Shout out to everybody that joined us today. We'll be back tomorrow. We're going to hear from the players themselves tomorrow, the wide receivers and defensive backs right here. Lucky Lefty Podcast. Have a great day. As always, make sure that you continue to spin it different, man. We appreciate you guys. Have a good one.